Welcome to Writing Black Joy, Season 3. I'm Sophia Robinson, and I'm a story listener, a writing coach, an editor, as well as the producer of Writing Black Joy, a virtual space that celebrates, centers, and promotes the voices of Black writers and storytellers with joyful and uplifting stories. Here, you'll find conversations with some of my favorite Black writers and storytellers, learn more about their projects and the joy they're bringing into the world, hear more about their creative processes and find inspiration for your own creative ventures, as well as tips and strategies for writing poetry, blogs, creative nonfiction, fiction, plays, and so much more from all types of writers, as well as a sneak peek into the writing life. You could even find your next favorite writer, book, poem, play, or blog. And if you're a Black writer who is looking for a coach or an editor to help you bring your joyful story into the world, then click on my website below to find out how to work with me. In the meantime, let's go to today's guest. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Writing Black Joy. So right at the beginning of this season, I promised that I was going to drop in a few of the season one episodes here. Uh, they've never been on the podcast app before. They were always housed on the Writing Black Joy website. But I thought it would be nice to bring some of them here so that those of you who weren't around during season one or who don't necessarily want to fiddle around with the website, just want to download a podcast episode and go, would have the opportunity to listen to some of the awesome conversations that I had during season one. So today is such a day. I am bringing you the episode I had with Isis Clay. Uh, She was amazing, and here is a little bit about her. Isis Clay is a master teacher, multidisciplinary theater artist, and educational consultant. She's developed theater arts curriculum for Prince George's Country Public Schools, the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services, and many, many local and regional theater companies. She served as a leader of Prince George's Country Theatre Advisory Board, where she developed and facilitated pre-service workshops while mentoring both new and seasoned teachers. Combining her extensive background in theatre and education, Isis founded Sculpted Clay Productions, where she uses innovative theatre-infused residencies and professional development workshops to help schools create trauma-sensitive, social-emotional focused learning environments for teachers and students. Now, you will want to listen to this interview with Isis. We're going to go deep, and it really was a wonderful conversation. Um, And Isis also read an excerpt to A Million Tiny Ways, and I will put the link to that excerpt in the show notes. So, whether you are a theatre professional or a theatre enthusiast, you will love this conversation I had with Isis. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hi everyone, I am back and I have my guest Isis with me today and I'm so excited about this conversation. Uh, Isis is a regular at my Creative Corner Clubhouse and she is so many things. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. She's a master teacher, a multidisciplinary theatre artist and this includes being a fabulous playwright. She's also an educational consultant. She has developed theater arts curriculum for Prince George's County Public Schools, the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services, and many local and regional theater companies. She served as a leader of the Prince George's County Theater Advisory Board, where she developed and facilitated pre-service workshops while mentoring both new and seasoned teachers. Combining her extensive background in theater and education, Isis founded Sculpted Clay Productions, where she uses innovative theater-infused residencies and professional development workshops to help schools create trauma-sensitive, social-emotional focused learning environments for teachers and students. Thanks for joining me, Isis. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Um, And of course, uh, to those of you who are following this project along, Isis is going to have an excerpt from one of her plays. Uh, that's going to be her piece. So uh, there'll be a link to this somewhere on this page. So just look for it. So Isis, uh, I would love you for you to tell us a little bit about your 
writing journey. I know you do so many things, so um, you can tell us about those things too, but <laughs> I'd love to know a bit about your writing journey and you know what makes you enjoy being a playwright and, and being in that process. Yeah, so the funny thing is I've, I've been writing all my life, right? Mm. But I feel like I just, no, I don't feel like, I know I just embraced that, um, that term playwright. I just mm. like within the past, maybe two months actually. What? Yeah. How yeah, long ago did you write and perform that solo show? I need to know this now because. So I wrote the solo show in 2018. Okay. And so for, for those who may not know that that's following you, um, uh, you said earlier, you know, I'm a multidisciplinary theater artist. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a solo show and um, that wasn't supposed to be a solo show. It was supposed to be a form of therapy for me, um, mm -hmm. dealing with secondary traumatic stress as an educator, dealing with um, just burnout. And it ended up again, being a, a solo show that was, that's been toured all over the place and even writing that. And that wasn't even my first play that I've written. No. <laughs> like I wrote a play, my very first play actually was written in elementary school and I mm -hmm. wish I could find that. But um, uh, my mom has it in a box somewhere. But um, think for that. yeah, I want to, I want to. Um, but the very first like play play that I wrote was called Standing on the Edge. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2012, 2011, 2012. And, um, you know, I, it, that also toured and, um, you know, got a little bit of success, but I still didn't see myself as a playwright. I, my background isn't in playwriting. It's in, it's in acting, it's in, mm -hmm. um, stagecraft, um, but not playwriting. And so <laughs> to date though, I have five, I've written five plays. <laughs> mm, sounds like a writer to me, but you know what? I think sometimes you know, I think it raises a good point because I always think about, uh, there's a lady who I follow, who I, I'm sure I mentioned in a conversation that I had with another um, interviewee like a couple of weeks ago, Javicia, and Javicia is definitely going to be joining us. I'm really looking forward to chatting to her. And she has a, a writing group and she always asks, like, when did you first feel like a writer? Mm -hmm. um, and I always think about that because I think like I never considered myself a writer, even though I, too, have been writing for the longest time. Like I came across my university yearbook a little while ago and there was a song in there that I had. It was like a pa song parody <laughs> that I had written that we all performed. But I like to me, that was just playing around and joking around. Like that wasn't anything serious. And I, first I was like, oh, I'll feel like a proper writer when I write a book and then I'll feel like a proper writer when I publish it. And then, I'll, and I feel sometimes like it, we're almost the last to know, <laughs> like we're almost the last to embrace mm. that, that title because we have this really fixed idea in our mind about what that thing looks like. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause I, and when you just said that, like it wasn't until, um, I have a piece that's been, um, a, a theater wants to wants me to develop it right? mm -hmm. and so that they can you know put it in their season and so they had me write a, a 10 minute and it's the one I'm going to share uh, in a little yes, bit yes which I love I can't wait to hear it here you read <laughs> I, it the uh, artistic director approached me before the project and um, I was like yeah you know we're looking for playwrights and you know you're a wonderful playwright because he had seen the solo show and I'm like, uh, but I'm not a playwright. So, but so you are to them. You say like you're the last one to know. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, girl. Sometimes <laughs> we are the last to know. You know that. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad you figured it out uh, uh, just in time for our interview. So yeah, that is perfect. And so then you said you've been writing since you were younger, and you wrote this play in elementary, and you obviously written other plays you've written the solo show you've written other things poetry. what poetry tell me and that's the other thing like you also write poetry <laughs> so I'm like you're just so many things what is it that you love about writing mm. you know depending on when you ask me that question you'll probably get a different answer mm. tell me so, what you love about it today <laughs> how I feel about it today is that it's a safe space for me mm. Mm -hmm. it's a safe space for me it's a place where I can 
put down whatever I need to put down, whatever I want to put down. And it doesn't necessarily have to be ever seen, you know, mm-hmm. no one ever has to read it. No one ever, but it's a place where I can kind of take a weight and sit mm-hmm. it down. And not even this, you know, I, I journal too, not as much as I should, but as much as I want. Oh, folks, I don't journal. So there's <laughs> never any judgment for anybody who doesn't, like, this is a huge, one of my other, uh, and she's also going to be a guest, uh, my friend, Ali, who actually does, a, she's a, you know, she's published a book and there are a lot, you know, she does a lot of journal prompts. She's like, she's a proper, she always laughs at me when I say, I hate journaling. So there's never going to be any judgment from me for not journaling. So you carry right on. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, and I'm not again, not even just in a journal way, but like like even with the the solo show with the 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 play that I'm going to you know share the play that I'm developing right now a million tiny ways. It's a vessel writing is always mm. you know, is always a vessel for me to kind of release. Um, and whether that release is a heavy release, whether it is, you know, something fun to kind of lose myself in for a while, um, whatever it is, it, it's a safe space. It's safe for me. I love that. And I've got a, a question for you because now that you now that you talk about journaling, I just suddenly had this thought that I've never really had before, which is that, you know, and I, I actually wrote a blog post um, a while ago about my journaling experiment because I, I did a 30 something day journaling experiment sort of last month. <clears throat> and it just occurred to me like, you know, you and I have talked before about like what role does the audience play when you're creating, especially, you know, you being a theater person. And for me, like writing blogs and books and feeling like the audience, having an audience is kind of part of the process. But I like that you said, nobody has to see it, right? So it's like, you get to choose, you know, there, there's so many things that I've written that nobody has seen. Right. Um, and I, I actually like that sometimes you write it and sometimes people see it and sometimes you're like no this is just for me I like that yeah it's perfect and you know I I think that's also one of the reasons why I was so hesitant to put a label on myself as a writer or as a playwright or whatever is because in my head I'm thinking if I'm a playwright and that means this becomes work this becomes something Mm. that I must, must commercialize that I must put out there that I must share and no no <laughs> it's always gonna be mind it's all just like your writing is always going to be yours and you choose yes. what uh, you share you get to see this piece you don't get to see that piece and yes. it's and and also sometimes you can write it for yourself and then you can decide like you know what I think somebody else would benefit from this just like you did with the solo show and I've done that too where I've written pieces where it was it really was just for me and then you know I shared it there was one piece I wrote ages ago and I wrote it and even though I, I did actually put it up on my blog, I have a, a whole selection of like hidden blog posts. And so I put it up as a hidden blog post and I shared it with a friend of mine. And I was like, what do you think of this? And next thing it had been shared like a <laughs> hundred times. And I was like, yeah, you realize I wasn't. But the thing is, I think because almost because I'd sort of written it not to share, mm. it was more, almost more vulnerable in a way. Not that I had written it, not, but I had written it not to share widely. I'd written it like I could right. share it with a friend or whatever. Um, it was fine. It was no problem at all. But it just kind of made me think that like, sometimes you write something and it's not to share mm-hmm. and then you share it anyway. And those sometimes are the things that I feel like make a really big impact. So I love that you turned that solo show, which was like for personal therapy mm-hmm. into something that has made such an impact on teachers and audiences all over the country. So mm-hmm. I absolutely love that. And I'm glad that just for today, you like writing and that's what you like about it. I don't, I don't love writing every day. I will not lie to you. So uh, <laughs> no judgment there at all. Now, as you know, this project is all about joyful stories by Black writers, um, something that's near and dear to me, and I'm assuming it is to you, or you would have said, no thanks, I think I'll pass. Um, Yes, yes, (laughs) yes, yes. I want you to tell me why you think that's so important to you. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I feel like, and and I hope my answer to this (laughs) doesn't come off as cliche or said before, but it's okay. so often the stories that are, 
are written about me, about my people, about people who look like me, um, tell the story through a lens of pain and tragedy and, mm -hmm. you know, um, that we, that it's, it almost becomes our identity in literary circles. I mean, not yeah. even literary, just, just in life, just right? In general, yeah. In general, oh, sure. that it becomes like a part of us. And I was in a, uh, a theater conference uh, the past two days and one of the keynote speakers, and I'm trying to, I'm going to, I'm going to quote her perfectly. So give me a second, mm -hmm. but Lady Dane Figueroa, she's an actress. Um, she's a director, producer, amazing soul. She said, my pain is not more sacred than my joy. Oh, and I said, oh, oh. Wait, wait a minute. Whoa. Wait a what? Minute. My pain is not more sacred than my joy. Oh. And that resonated so deeply with my soul. Um, it was like she rang a bell. And that's why it's important. It is important. You know, yes, there have been things, you know, there have been traumas that people have gone through. There have been traumas that our people have gone through. There have yeah. been traumas, you know, but that does not define us. No. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this in the first place, because I've always felt that way. And, and I don't want to diminish the painful experiences that people have right. had, but, but like, just to, you know, I was having a conversation. I do not know why that does that every single time. Um, sorry, listeners, my computer does weird things. Um, and I was having this conversation with a friend of mine um, a couple of days ago, actually. And I was sharing with her some of the posts because obviously for this whole project, I've been creating social media posts and different stuff. And I shared one with her and she said to me, you know, she read it and she was like, it was just a reminder to her that like she gets to have joy too because her business is all about transmuting um, out of painful experiences. And sometimes she feels like she can almost get lost in that. And it's easy to do because, you know, if there's a lot of pain there, it's easy to feel to get lost in it and to not feel as if the joy is sacred as well. And so to me, it's like, you need to focus on that, not because the other stories aren't important, but because these ones are important too. And so I love that quote, like that is, I'm, I'm gonna, so you need to send me the correct spelling of her name because I will be quoting that. That is beautiful. I love that. I will. I will. Uh, she's amazing. I uh, had the opportunity to work with her on several occasions. She is. Uh, uh, I love that. But that again, it just like, oh, hits so, so deeply. Mm. And um, my son is a writer. Um, and actually my husband is too. He, my husband writes fiction, but he's like Ooh. a undercover writer. He is he undercover? Writer. Yeah. I might have to interview him too. You tell him to look out for my email. <laughs> he's been writing his novel for, for a while now. And it's just amazing. And, and I've been that voice. It's like, okay, you have to finish. You got to get it out. You got to get it out. Um, but my son kind of took the best of both of our worlds and he's a screenwriter. He's going to Columbia, uh, Excellent. He's going to Columbia next month. And, um, his mountain that he stands on and he has stood on this for the last few years is that he refuses to write from a place of pain. Thank from, you. Um, from, you know, from black pain, from indigenous pain, you know, he just refuses to do that because he was like in his life through his family, all he sees is joy. Yeah. And he was like, it, it, it doesn't make sense to broadcast that. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm so pleased that he feels that he's grown up in an environment where he gets, he gets that, that feeling because I love to me it's, um, and this is something that I, um, spoke to, so I, I was my first, I was the first interview for this project and I was talking to my friend Thea, who's a podcaster, and I was asking her if she'd ever heard um, Chimamanda Adichie's TED Talk called The Danger of a Single Story. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I'm going to, I'm going to share it um, on social media, so I'll, I'll tag you in that post, but 
that's exactly what it's about. It's about this single narrative. She's a um, Nigerian. Mm-hmm. And she talks about how there's this single narrative of like, this is what Africa is like, or this is mm-hmm. what it's like to be X or Y. And people aren't necessarily even aware that they only have this, this one narrative to um, sort of anchor <laughs> a whole group of people towards whether it's a country whether it's a, a, a you know a group of people that come under a particular ethnicity you know whether it's being an artist and being broke like whatever that is there's a single story that you have and I love that firstly that his single story is joy like I absolutely love that because then to me that's like there's benefits to that too but also that he will bring different narratives then to the single story that people may have when it comes to screen, uh, yeah. not screens, <laughs> films and, yeah. and, and TV and stuff like that. So I cannot wait to see what he does. Yeah. Uh, I love that so, so, so much. I should have done a whole family interview with you guys, but anyhow, <laughs> no problem. We will rectify that soon <laughs> enough. So I'm so, I, I love your sort of views on that. Um, I, the third question was supposed to be about a quote from someone you admire that represents joy to you, but I feel like we have covered that. And I want you to say that, say the quote again and the lady's name again. I love that. Just Yes, Lady Dane Figueroa. Mm-hmm. And her the quote is, my pain is not more sacred than my joy. Oh, just giving me goosebumps. I absolutely love that so, so much. As soon as she said it, I wrote it all over everywhere on my desk. I'm like <laughs> scribbling furiously. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh it's it. It's it's perfect for this. It's perfect for this. Um, what's your what's been your proudest moment then as a since you're not, you know, maybe not embracing the whole screenwriter? Tell me just what's been your proudest moment in terms of your theater um career, you know, from childhood onwards. Well, honestly, I could I could speak on this as a writer. Um, so there are two that come to mind, but the one I think that that sticks out the most to me, um, I don't know if it sticks out the most. I'll, I'll give both of them. Okay, give them both. <laughs> give them both. You can. So, it and they all you know derive around the, the the solo show. And so when I when I first wrote it, um, a good friend of mine who had a theater company, um, Goldie Patrick was her is her name, and um, she had a theater company for Black girls and women. And she was, she knew I was coming out of the classroom and she was like, what do you want to do? And I told her, um, you know, that I was playing around with this, the idea of this play, but it wasn't really something that was going to be presented. She was like, nope, you're going to present that, write that. And I'm like, (laughs) and she was like, and I have the perfect place. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she was like, I'll send you the information. Well, when she sent me the information, it was a spot at the Kennedy Center in a festival Ooh. in Washington, D.C. What? And I was like, uh-huh. whoa, oh, okay, okay. Nice. So it was just like this this pressure to, you know, to create what I had already written, which was not supposed to be shared, and then make it into a play, a, a mm-hmm. fully fledged out play. And so presenting that at the Kennedy Center in front of former students, um, in front of, you know, a, amongst other people that made me proud because I felt like, I don't know, I just felt proud to have finished it. But the last time I performed it for public was Mm -hmm. also in Washington DC at uh, the Atlas Performing Arts Center. And that one sticks out and I was most proud because that was in front of a a bunch of educators, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, it, it hadn't, it wasn't supposed to be for educators, but it ended up being for you know a lot of educators in the in the in the audience, and afterwards they just came up to me, and a lot of them were in tears. And then at that point, I realized I, I don't think until that point I realized that my that writing that specific piece of writing wasn't just for me. Mm-hmm. You know that there was hope in it that other teachers saw. There was a reflection of their experiences that hadn't been reflected back to them before that. So I was proud to be able to to speak to them from an authentic place. Yeah, and I love that so much. And, you know, 
I, I there's so I stalk you on Clubhouse. I'm sure you're probably aware of that by now. Um, I'm not the only one as well. Like I've, I have another friend, and he also stalks you on Clubhouse. So we stalk you together. And um, I I remember hearing you say that. How did you put it? Um, you're always going to be a teacher. Always. Right. Even though you're no longer in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's like, it's just a testament to like, I did this thing and I didn't even think it was for anybody. And it's still able to teach and, and sort of talk to people through that performance and through the, the, the play, even though you thought it was a leader to teach you something. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I absolutely love that. So so much yay um i'm curious what has been the most difficult um part of this journey as a writer as a theater professional oh that's a, a double question um because mm -hmm. the answer is different as a answer writer, them both separately I, i'd love to hear them both yeah yeah so as a writer um the most difficult is when Either there is an emotional block that I can't write through for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm dealing with that right now with the play that I'm developing. There's an emotional block that I won't allow. You're going to have a conversation about that <laughs> very yeah. shortly, but go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I stare at the page, I stare at the screen and um, nothing comes. Of course, that that is difficult as a writer. Um, as a, as a theater artist, it's been, you know, barring the last year where we're dealing with the, uh, you know, dealing with COVID and dealing with the shutdowns and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even before then, um, there's a bit of isolation that I wasn't prepared for mm. when it comes to being a, a theater artist or, or an actor, you know, whether it's film or whatever you have these amazing experiences with these amazing people and artists, but it's like a flash in the pan mm. and it's over. And then you're alone again, auditioning for something else or in your car mm. driving here, there, you know, for rehearsals for, and so I spent a lot of time alone, whether it was in my car, whether it was in, you know, my rehearsal room by, at home, you know, wherever. And I wasn't prepared for that, you know, coming from the classroom, you know, there's, there was my teacher bestie that was right next door. You know, there, I was surrounded by students all the time e to the point where, you know, driving home, I have to turn off the radio cause I just need silence. Mm. But then I was hit with this wall of just, you know, I don't know. So I wasn't prepared mm. for that. And that's the hardest thing I think is, is the isolation that you can feel when you're not actively in a project and I think you know and like I, I've said to you before like I am a real amateur you know like school drama club uh, a few years ago I was uh, we did a play um, combining the students uh, from the school I went to and some of the um, alumni that was really fun nice. and I think it was fun um, what I what I can say when you talk about the isolation, it's almost like a feast or famine type of thing because while you're, while you're, you know, like rehearsing and sort of like getting that thing, you almost feel like these people become your family, yes. right? Like at least that was the feeling that I had, yes. and it was like seeing them every day, and you know, it was. I don't even know how to explain it, how to describe yeah. it. And then all of a sudden you're up on stage and it's like there are lights in your face and it's like, this is it. And it's all come together. And then like two nights later, you're like, uh, yeah. what's going on here? And yeah. that's it, you know, back to reality. Well, for me, it was back to reality because I mean, I was, you know, still going to work and stuff, but like, I never saw some of those people again. Yeah. Yeah. And it is such, crazy. it is crazy. It's really, really odd. So I totally understand that. Um, how how do you move through writer's block or emotional blocks? Do you have any sort of techniques or things that you've tried? Yeah. So one of the things that helps is I love to dance. I mm. Zumba is my my go to workout. You know, mm, nice Zumba uh, routine uh, routines. But um, so so working out, especially to music, especially to loud music. If I can't blast it in my house, then I have my headphones on and I'm blasting it through the headphones to kind of um, 
shock my system and you know into kind blow of out the cobwebs yeah 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 um but also my husband has been and my son but mostly my husband has been a amazing sounding board right um because he's he's so imaginative um mm. a lot of times things will come to me in impressions right like a sound or an image or something and i'm like i gotta fit this in here some kind of way and i will t you know explain to him what it is and he's like wow that kind of sounds like x y and z mm. and like, oh you're right oh wow that is a good and then that jump starts it a lot of times but um so between getting the endorphins going with you know dancing and music um and talking to him that usually helps that usually nice helps. And I love that you have that. I always say you can never write alone. And um, I think that's just such a classical example of how sometimes other people can really help you in that process. Um, so yeah, I completely get that. So what would you tell a prospective, a person who feels like they want to write a play? Let's, let's specifically talk about writing a play now. I know you're a poet as well, but like, what would yeah. you tell somebody who wanted to write a play specifically? So of course, there's all this uh, technical things, you know, to know as far as like how to write dialogue, how to write stage directions and how mm -hmm. to not write, write in a narrative form. But beyond all of that, beyond all of that, at the core of a play is someone who wants something so bad and is up against what seems like insurmountable odds. Whether it's a comedy, whether it's a drama, tragedy, whatever, it's always that. It's someone who wants something or encounters something and they have to overcome this thing. These obstacles are thrown in their way. And so if you want to write a play, think about something that is personal to you. Think about something that you would like to see because that's also one of the things that that inspire me now to write is what do I want to see on stage? Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I'm, I'm tired of, of looking at plays by white men. They don't tell my story. Nope. Okay, they, they're fine. And there's a, a million gazillion of them. I want to see something that reflects my life, reflects who I am reflects the, the people I see in my neighborhood, you know, my family, what does that look like? Um, and start there, start there. And as you know, Octavia E. Butler, who I absolutely adore. Love. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, she said something and I'm going to butcher her. I'm going to misquote her so bad. But um, I think she said something like you start out writing crap <laughs> and, and you think it's good but then you gradually get better at it. Like get over the fact that don't think that what you write on the page is going to be the next Pulitzer or the next great American novel or whatever. No, 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 no. Not yet. Nine times out of 10 is going to be crap when you first start. And it's okay. Mm. It's okay because you've taken that first step. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, this is a quote that I live by. Um, now um start before you're ready right oh yeah mm -hmm. start before you're ready just get this jump in jump yeah you can be scared while you're flying but don't wait because don't you're wait until you don't feel scared and i actually had this conversation with a friend of mine the other day because she posted this thing on social media that said like you know where in your life do you feel brave and i was like you brave never like i'm all about like the just pack your fresh pants in your handbag because you're going to probably need it. Type right. Of thing. And, you know, she said, but that is brave. And I was like, but it doesn't feel brave. Mm -hmm. And I think a part of the problem is people, people think you have to feel brave in order to be brave. Like they, they, they want to get that feeling of like, yeah, I'm ready to go before they take the first step. And it's like, you're not going to feel that way before you take the first step. And you may never feel that way. Mm -hmm. And that's also okay. Yeah. But you can't let that hold you back from taking that first step. So I think that's really good. One thing I want to I want to ask you about though is you talk about like knowing that first 
you know, when you start, it's going to be crap. And I think that is something that, that is something that I, I struggle with, mm. depending on what I'm writing. Like, I have this thing where I kind of lower the stakes. So, you know, probably I really want to write a book, but I'm, you know, when I want to write a book, but I'm like, you know what, let me start a blog. I write small things and I kind of build up to that thing. But what I have found difficult, especially there's a, there was a, there's a novel that I've been, I was working on, I've been working on it since last year. I'm still working on it. I, I thought I was going to finish it in July. I'm not even close to finishing it. And what's hard for me is that it seems so important that I don't want it to be crap. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that pressure that I put on myself actually means that I'm probably not going to write it at all, or I might not, I might not finish it because I feel like, you know, that book, like I, I've written a few novels and there are like love story, like lessons in love and things like, they can be crap. Cause like, you know, that doesn't matter, but like this really matters. I don't want it to be crap. And that, that sort of pressure, I think it makes it harder for me to kind of go through the motions of just writing it and just doing it and just putting it out there. And I've, no, I've never really said that to anybody before because it just like, I'm almost like, it almost sounds like how obnoxious are you thinking that your story is so important, but like, that's how it feels. It feels like it's about, you know, it's supposed to be about these women and, you know, they're superheroes. It's, I, I won't bore you with the, the details, but like when I came with the idea, I was like, this is so important. And it felt yeah. so important. Yeah. I didn't want it to be crap. It is important. But just like anything that you write, your first draft is going, doesn't have to be <laughs> amazing. I should know this, it's right? not going to be amazing. It's not. Yeah, yeah I know, should know this. Yeah. When I taught playwriting in, in, in high school, I would just tell them to get to the end and mm. know that, literally know that what you write is going to be a shadow of what it's going to be. You know, what you're trying to That's do so is true. Get, get it out of your head. Right, get it out of your head, get to the end. And now we can start playing building blocks. Now we can start playing Jenga and taking things out and placing them in other places. And now we can add more, you know, but until then it stays locked here and that's not doing mm. anybody any good. That's true, very true. And I, the thing is I instinctively, I tell that to my clients, like I know that for other people, but I realize that sometimes you're doing it yourself and you don't even know. Um, well, and so I thank you. I medicine. I know physician doctor. heal thyself. Yes. Okay. I have to. I thank you for reminding me. I thoroughly appreciate it. Um, I have a kind of a kind of random question to ask you, and I just realized I've always wanted to know the answer to this question. When you write a play, mm -hmm. because I'm so used to writing narrative, right? Like, do you write it? And I had a um, months ago. I had a friend. She's still my friend. Uh, who wanted to write a play? And she was kind of, she was getting very hung up on the structure of it, like so much so that she wasn't actually writing, basically. Mm -hmm. how, how, tell me more about that process. Like, do you, do you kind of have the story all in your mind and you write it as a narrative first and then you kind of pull out the dialogue? Do you just kind of write and see what, like, like I, I, I don't know if, I don't know what happens to you, but my characters talk to me when I'm writing. Yeah. Huh? They, yeah. they talk to me. They're like, no, no, no. I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. <laughs> I ain't doing that. This is what I'm doing. Like they tell me, mm -hmm. right? So well, tell me a bit about that process. So there hasn't been one play. There's never been a play that I've written that I've written the same way twice. So that <laughs> actually isn't, I don't feel like I'm qualified to give you the, probably the answer that, you, that you're looking for. Uh, no, I, I actually love the answer, but go ahead. The solo ahead. show started out of, of like, te technically it started out from a letter that I wrote my students, mm. you know, that I, you know, wrote to them. It started out of that, um, things that they never knew about me. And again, they, it wasn't ever meant for them to, to read. Um, it was very, you know, therapeutic things that they didn't know about me, things that I was, I was dealing with and, um, what made me do the wrong thing as a teacher at, at a specific time. Like, you know, so it was, it was kind of that, um, standing on the edge. The first play that I wrote was actually out of old writings when I was a teenager. Like I found my, my like journal that had like a bunch of poems and I realized how angsty I sounded. It was just like full of teenage angst and oh my mm. God, 
good. And then I realized that my students were dealing with the same thing. And so I took some of that poetry. I took some new writings. I workshopped it with some students and, you know, came up with something that looked very different than um, those writings that in high school. Um, A Million Tiny Ways <laughs> was written through tears. Um, mm. Like no... <laughs> no pulling cards. It literally was written through tears and it was just like uh, line by line. And again, it hasn't, you know, I'm not yeah, you haven't yet. finished it. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah. You know, it, but it was one of those things where I just kind of wrote and didn't know where it was going to go. I was just writing um, from the heart. I don't think I've ever written a narrative per se. Say, like a like a short story and then turn that mm. into a play okay but I, I will say this one play that I did write um unbroken mm. a character kept nagging at me kept nagging at me and I didn't know and so I started doing some research and ended up writing um a play about Chick Webb he was he was a drummer during the um, the Renaissance, um, nice and um, it, not not his bio biography, but he's in it. So it's the biography of a of a character that I completely made up, but he's in the story, and he kept hmm. like bugging me, like in my head, and not, and so I just you know created from that from a from a character. I love that so much. And I laugh because uh, there is an author that I do like, um, Neil Gaiman, and he writes, um, you know, fiction, fantasy, that type of thing. And one of the books that I listened to him, the audio book, I've listened to it several times. It's like 20 hours long. Um, and he says at the beginning of it that he he wanted to write you know, he wanted, he's, he's British. Okay. So that's right there. Um, and he's like, he wanted to write this novel about coming to America and, you know, taking the train and all this stuff. And he said, he thought that by the end of it, that he would, you know, he would, he would be able to tell you how to write a novel. And all he could tell you by the end of it was how to write this novel. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is the truth. And I think, I think to me, that is actually one of the hardest things other hard things about writing this novel that I'm writing and the hardest things I think about being a writer in general is that just when you think you've got it figured out you have to realize like you're probably never going to figure it out and every like you said every book may very well be different and you know if you feel like you're going to use a formula that might work for some people I mean like there's a, <laughs> there's a few people I read that you know, I'm pretty sure that they have a formula that they right, use. Right, right. But you it's, can tell. <laughs> oh, believe me, I can tell. But that's not how it works for me. Neither. And, and it's interesting to hear, like, even people that I really admire say the same thing. And you say the same thing as well. Of course, I really admire you. Which is that, like, all I can tell you by the end of this is how I wrote this. I can't tell you how to write a play or a book or a whatever. Like, all I can tell you is this is how I wrote this. Mm -hmm. next on to the next adventure yeah 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 and I absolutely adore that um speaking of books what type of things do you like to read if indeed you have time to read because I know everybody doesn't I okay so I have fallen off um reading like I need to but I love mm. I love fantasy I love um me too you know I, I mentioned Octavia E. Butler and you know sci-fi sci um, have you ever read Karen Lord? No. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, she's a, she's a Barbadian actually, and she writes sci-fi as well. I think you'd like her stuff if you like sci-fi. So I'm giving everybody listening, putting a recommendation out there, Karen Lord. Um, look for her. For her stuff. Awesome. Good. I love, I love horror too. I'm a, I've just started to kind of get into what well, I had just at the beginning of the pandemic, um, started trying to get into like horror and um, suspense novels. Wow. Like, like cheesy ones, because it's so easy to be cheesy. You're telling me. <laughs> it's so easy to be cheesy. But um, uh, there's this, oh my gosh, The Hunger is the name of this this book. And of course, I can't think of the author's name right now. Um, I'll get it to you. But The Hunger, and it's about uh, westward, westward expansion in uh, North America. 
And so mm-hmm. it was written, you know, during that time and this group of people go west seeking, you know, their better fortune and things go crazy quickly. And so it's a this suspense, it's got horror in it and it's very, uh, it shocked me. Because when I first wow. started reading it, I was like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> Covered wagons, what is this? <laughs> um, but it's it's pretty good. Mm, okay, well, I, I'm gonna, I'll file that away. And now that you say that I'm, I've, I've decided I almost feel like I want to make a book list for this, for this project, because everybody I've spoken to has got different books that they like reading and I'm, yeah, I think that's an idea that I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably get a, have a page just with a book list. So that's, thanks for the idea, Isis, appreciate it. Um, that is really good. And so this is going to be my last sort of question to you. Um, and then I believe you are going to be reading us an excerpt from A Million, is it A Million Tiny Ways? A Million Tiny Ways. Um, anybody listening to this, it, I'm probably going to put the audio separate. So you'll just click on the link on the page and you'll, you'll find your way to it. But um, A Million Tiny Ways. But the last thing I want you to do is tell us, uh, tell us where we can find you, where we can find you know, follow you, stalk you on Clubhouse like I do, uh, and tell us what you do out there in the world with your work, because I, I would love you to share that with our, our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So I am <laughs> I am a woman divided. <laughs> I will say that. And the reason I say that, uh, my company, Sculpty Clay Productions, um, you kind of spoke about it earlier, um, does educational consulting through the lens of arts infused work. And so you can find all things Sculpted Clay, um, Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, and the handle is at Sculpted Clay. Mm -hmm. And then on Twitter, it's just a little different. It's at Sculpted underscore Clay. Mm -hmm. Um, You can catch the website at www.sculptedclayproductions.com, written all the way out. Mm-hmm. And if you're interested about me as a actress, um, www.isisclay.com. And Isis is spelled A-Y-E-S-I-S. Mm-hmm. Yay. And, and people, you need to go find her. She's awesome. Um, tell her I sent you. Tell her. <laughs> but yeah, I absolutely love that so much. So thank you so much um, for chatting with me, Isis. I never get tired of talking to you. So I really appreciate it so, so much. Um, Audience, click on the link and go and listen to Isis reading an excerpt from her play. Thanks, bye. Thank you for joining us today. You can find out more about our guests in the notes below. And don't forget to hit subscribe to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss new episodes when they drop. And if this has inspired you to get your own writing project into the world, click on my website below and learn how you can work with me as a writing coach or an editor. Until next time, I send you big love from a small island.